Well, we are so pleased to have you joining us for another edition, another episode of Curiosity Not Judgment. My name is Birga. And I'm Gary. So Gary and I are both at conferences often. We're often at workshops and places where there's groups of people that are getting together to talk about ideas, to brainstorm, to figure out the future, to solve all kinds of problems. And inevitably, it comes down to asking some good questions Mm -hmm. and really listening to the answers that the people in the room have to share, as well as getting the input from constituents, as we have talked about numerous times before. But as I alluded to last podcast, there are often situations that we get into when we're not really asking the right question to get to the heart of the issue, or we ask questions and don't actually listen to the answer or simply have the data and don't do anything about it. Those are two topics I definitely want to jump into a little bit today. But I also want to, if we can talk with the time, squeeze in the idea of, are there some alternative ways of getting answers that don't involve talking to one another, especially when things are getting heated or elevated emotionally? And if you need to honor and respect a boundary where somebody is getting real agitated, Can you still go forward with communication if that line of questioning, that curious posture, doesn't seem to lend itself to conversation? Mm. All very good questions. I was just at a convening today um, about um, the Advanced Energy Alliance, and they're trying to get something going, and uh, they had the right constituents in the room. And I think a very valid question is, did we ask the right questions uh, to to not only establish this, but to establish a direction, establish a focus, establish um, a strategy, uh, a, a vector, speed and direction, um, and from which to uh, to address some of New Mexico's problems. And I know that you're doing this in the nonprofit space a lot, and uh, and it's very similar. How do you get uh, various stakeholders around a table, which we you and I both do all the time? to get uh, the engagement part, to get the, how do you get various stakeholders around a table to discuss something, thought leaders, Mm -hmm. and engage them in the conversation? And uh, one of the major things is, uh, are we asking the right question? Um, So how do you do that? Well, one of the exercises I I was sharing, I I haven't caught you up a lot on what has been going on since we last were together Mm -hmm. face to face, but I've been going through this evaluation lab that the university is putting on and it's really getting into the nitty gritty about survey formation and how do you host uh, work groups? How do you host, you know, the interview process when you're trying to get data from people either for grant reporting purposes, you're trying to appeal to a funder, you're trying to report out to your board of directors, mm-hmm. right? How do you get the data around the stuff that you're doing, the product you're selling, etc.? So that's really what I've been focusing on the last three days. And so this has all kind of been dumped into my brain. And it's, it's really stimulating conversation and thoughts for me, but it gets really heavy really fast and it can get overwhelming really fast. And so how do you ask the right questions? Well, let's pause for yeah, a second. Okay. What yeah. you're trying to do in that evaluation lab, you just say evaluation lab like everybody knows what that is. So what you're trying to do there is you're saying, okay, we're going to take some action. Are we taking the right action? Is it having the desired effect? Mm-hmm. Is that kind of it? Yeah, I, I think this is a really broad educational process because there's so many different types of entities in the room. So there's everything from incubators that do restaurant startups mm-hmm. to nonprofit mm-hmm. uh, and, and everything in between. Even city government is in there, right? Mm-hmm. So I think everybody's curious about how do you measure your stuff? How do you measure your stuff? Got right. It. So that I, I'd say that's the general description. How right. do you measure your stuff? Got it. So in the measurement has to be the right questions. Mm-hmm. And so I touched on that in the last podcast. So I won't, I won't regurgitate that too much, but just simply to say, you have to be really intentional to map out for yourself before the questioning starts, what is the data that you really need? Mm-hmm. If the data is how many people out of, you know, all of the clients that I serve or all of the customers I serve, how many people are going to return, right? If that's the ultimate metric that you have to, to get the answer for, then you have to be very intentional about how you're going to craft your questions around mm-hmm, it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I can imagine that, yeah, it, the, the, in the answer to the questions, you can almost guide people to give answers uh, and skew the data if you're not careful. Absolutely. Intentionally or unintentionally, um, A. And B, 
if if you let's say you're trying to add, ask the right question in order to establish a, a direction for a group or an organization, um, and then on the backside, are we going in the right direction? Are we doing the right things? Right? Okay. Yeah. No, that that makes a lot of sense to me. So difficult, and um, you know, I always think about. I've been through facilitator training, and as an engineer, I'm always like. Ugh, Really, I mean, I want to facilitate my own meetings, and they're saying, "No, Gary, you have to have your own. You have to have a separate facilitator because you might guide the answer." And I'm like, "Well, I want to guide the answer." <laughs> so, <laughs> so, 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 of course, they made me go through facilitation training, and I get it. But wouldn't it be great is if if you started out asking a question, and then a little bit into the process, you paused and you said, "Okay." Given the discussion, are we asking the right question? Mm. Should we reformulate the question? Right. So if you've got stakeholders around the table in terms of other company leaders, other industry leaders, the pause in asking that question is the right thing to do. But if they're the people that are going through the, the process, project, whatever, mm, I see what those saying. are not yeah. the right people yes. to pause and ask that question That's because right. they don't know what you're getting at. They don't know. That's right. They don't know what they don't know. Sure. And they don't know what the what the ultimate goal is often, uh, which is interesting also. But yeah, okay. That makes sense. So how do you ask the right question? How do you know it's the right question to ask? How do you know you're not leading people? Mm -hmm. And how do you keep your own agenda and motivation out of it? Right. And I certainly don't have time to unpack all of that during the course of this podcast, but I'll just say there are absolutely resources available. If you're somebody that wants to answer those questions for yourself, maybe you work in an HR department, maybe you are someone that's going to connect some surveys that you're trying to gather data around your organization or your business, I would say those questions need to be answered before you engage. Yeah. 100%. And because this is such a complex issue, and I certainly can't in three or four minutes just do a, do an overview of that. I, I mean, I'm literally taking a 40-hour course to, to learn these answers right now. So it's a lot. It's intense. But I think it's just so key that those questions even get asked up front. They, are we asking the right question? Are we framing this in a way that we're leading the answers are we, you know, are we going to do something with the data that we collect, which is, I think, the other the other piece of this. So kind of circling to that example of, you know, you've got industry leaders, thought leaders around a table, you're leading a, a seminar, you're speaking at an event, you've got some powerful people in the room. So once you've asked the questions and you've come up with an answer, then what? Because everybody represents different organizations, they may or may not be the ultimate decision maker. And if you now have this evidence that says this particular thing, what are you going to do to make a difference on that particular thing? And this is the really difficult part because we had a situation today where we had everybody from university to national labs to uh, people who ran companies in, in the clean tech space to uh, Sierra Club, etc. And the each person came with their own lens, their own agenda. Mm -hmm. And the facilitator, the main facilitator, we had four breakout groups. Each group kind of reported out. It's the standard kind of thing mm -hmm. we've seen. And at the end of the day, he says, okay, now I'm going to try to assimilate all this. Mm, good luck. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So how do you assimilate that? And how do you get a direction out of those dis disparate lenses and agendas that everyone can agree on? And is that the goal? Mm. Oh, I'm so glad you brought this up. This is something that I know they're not going to cover this week in this session that I'm taking, but I think this is where it touches on AI again, right? So if you are mm. doing surveys, rate this one through five, yes or no, blue or red, right? You, you have data sets that you can quickly assemble and sort through if you're doing those type of questions. But if you're doing open-ended questions, tell me the three most impactful moments that you had during our breakout session, right? And if you've got a hundred of those to actually go through that data and condense it for that report out, so to speak, I, I think that's where AI may hmm. be really, really mm -hmm. helpful in something like this. So if you're able to feed in a hundred long form answers yeah. to any particular question and say, summarize this or pick the top five themes that have emerged from these various answers. I am very curious to see what AI is going to do for that in the future. 
I love that. And even if AI does not do a good job and is off base a little bit, you've got an answer in front of you. And then that's something you can look at and evaluate and say, yeah, that's close, but you've missed this nuance. Yes. And then you can kind of take that as a staged approach mm -hmm. to actually getting to the right answer, mm -hmm. even if AI doesn't do a good job. But I love that open-ended question thing. We don't usually ask open-ended questions, right. though, do we? Maybe for that reason. Maybe yeah. we, don't, we don't really want it's to hard. take the time to yeah. sort through all of the answers. Yeah. Yeah. And when you have a broad question, like one of today's was, how would we start this thing up, all right? Um, and it's meant to be kind of a, a clean tech labs kind of resource center, et cetera. And, you know, some people went to the physical aspects. Some people went, I said, navigators to try to figure out all the different laws and, and regulations and grant opportunities and things mm -hmm. like that, um, which are, I think is sorely needed. But there, there's different people. People went to the physical, people went to the psychological, people went to the support systems, people went to different places and assimilating all that into one place. So we had flip charts and flip charts and flip charts of stuff. Mm -hmm. And I think, how would you possibly summarize that? But boy, if you could just snap a snapshot of that and it does a convert to text and spits out a summary, uh, that would be ideal because what is the facilitator trying to do in this case? They're trying to say, okay, with all these lenses, is there something we can do? Because mm -hmm. especially sitting here in New Mexico, I will say that many of us, I get frustrated that we're not doing anything, mm. right? So let's do something and then we can pivot. But we're so afraid of spending a dollar on something that doesn't work, apparently, that we sometimes get frozen and we don't do anything. Yes. So let's do, let's pick a portfolio of things, a, a couple of trends, and let's fund that and then see from there what works, right? And it's more of the... Don't sit back and wait for your passion to all of a sudden appear to you. Go out and start doing things. Look for fascination. And then that'll tell you what your passion is, right? It's, it's two different approaches. But how would, you, how would you take flip charts of stuff, look for the common themes, do a number of things in a portfolio fashion, call it focus, mm -hmm. right, versus shotgun approach, mm -hmm. and then how do you proceed? I've got so many things to say and I'm not going to have time to say them in this episode. So I, I'm, I'm going to pivot my own brain a little bit. Yep. I'm going to deflect that answer for a moment because I, wa I want to touch on something that I think is kind of parallel to this. So Jeff, sorry, I'm going to hope I don't embarrass you, Jeff, um, gave a really good response on or, or gave a really uh, fruitful comment, I should say, on the episode from this last posting. And so I wanted to share a little bit what he said because it, it really got me thinking. And of course, now that I'm trying to pull it up, my computer's frozen. Um, it was something along the lines of, so he's a pastor and they are doing some surveying among the congregants to see if the church is meeting the needs of the congregants. And so I applaud that effort, but on the question, not but, and on the question of what are you going to do with the answers and do you even have the capacity to fulfill what might come up in such a survey or in such a line of questioning. Because if you've got, I don't know how many people are in the church, but let's say there's a hundred responses to this survey. And if 20% said, I need a break in the middle of the sermon to go to the restroom, <laughs> right? I, I'm, right? I'm being yep. a little bit yeah, silly, yeah, yeah. but yep. are you going to be able to listen and respond and change the way you're operating in order to meet the needs? And, and at what percentage of vocalization That's of the, the need, tipping point. Yeah. Do, do you change? Boy, um, this, uh, so I remember there was a thing called Teams 360 or uh, uh, Feedback 360, something like that, that was a big deal back in, I think, the late 80s, early 90s in my time at Intel. And we all wanted to get feedback from all of our stakeholders, not just our boss, but our peer teams, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. It was all that, all that stuff. And it was very good. I'm saying stuff like I'm, like I'm being flippant about it. It was very valuable. As I'm trying to sell this within the organization, and people would say, well, wait a minute. Am I supposed to take all the feedback and try to change to be perfect to all the feedback? No. But wouldn't you like to know the feedback? Mm -hmm. You can say, that's great feedback. Thank you. I'm not doing, I'm not changing a thing. That's great feedback. Yeah, I probably could be more effective if I mm -hmm. kind of tweaked a little bit this way. Knowing that you're not going to wholesale change anyway. Mm -hmm. But at least I would rather know that people are thinking about that. So A, I'd rather know. And then B, up front, 
we needed to make sure that we told people just because you state an opinion on this, just because you have some feedback doesn't mean I'm going to act on it, mm. right? I still am in control of my own actions. I'm still uh, going to be who I am and I appreciate the feedback. Mm -hmm. I may or may not change based on the feedback and I may or may not want to change based on the feedback, but at least I have it and at least I'm curious enough to want it. Right. And so those are the kind of things that are really tough up front. So, you know, never, never ask, never do an evaluation, never ask people what they want if you're not going to listen to them. Right. Famously, one of the managers went out and said, OK, I want to know everything that would make this a better workplace. Mm. And then he got all this feedback. And, 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 he's, and one of those side things was, what should we do about uh, different shifts that we might create for different people to work in? Mm -hmm. And he got all this feedback, and some of it was amazing. Mm -hmm. He did nothing with it. Mm. And that was more frustrating than if he had asked in the first place. Right, right. So I, I want to have you clarify a little bit. If you're, if you're saying up front, let's say in, in the case of Jeff the pastor, so Jeff says to everyone, hey guys, we're going to do this survey. I really want to hear your feedback. I may not take action on that feedback, but I want your feedback. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that cause some people to think, well, why am I going to give it if he's not going to act on it? Yeah, absolutely. But it goes to what you started to say there is if it, if it was one person versus 20% sure. versus 50% versus 100%. Um, so there's a little bit of that and, and he's going to want to serve, you know, the most uh, people. Um, but it's also going to have, um, the, you can see trends, mm -hmm. you can see patterns, mm -hmm. you can see things that are working and not working in that feedback as a whole. Mm -hmm. So maybe a better way to say it is your specific comment, you may not see a change based on your specific comment. But as a whole, mm -hmm. I think it's really necessary that I ask the question and that I understand and get the feedback. Yeah. So in the story that you shared about this manager who asked for all this feedback and got really impactful feedback, what what was the motivation behind asking the question if there was never any intention of doing anything with it? He was told to. Ah, interesting. So it simply was, you know, the higher ups say, hey, see what the people want. He yes. saw what the people want and then didn't care. Yes. It was my classic example of um, don't tell a manager who you know is not going to do anything with the responses mm -hmm. to go do a survey of what was going to make a better workplace. Anyway, and, and the, but the point of that is is not that, um, you know, who was right and who was wrong in that situation. It's just that don't go ask people their opinions of something if you're literally going to ignore them. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, uh, and set expectations up front mm -hmm. that, um, look, I do want all of your feedback. Mm -hmm. I may or may not have the resources to do. Okay, I want golden toilets in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not doing that. Right. Okay. Uh, and, and so it's, it's, I'm going to take the feedback and I'm going to do what I think is best for the organization, mm -hmm. um, or whether it's a church, a company, a, a nonprofit, whatever it is based on the resources we have, the culture we're trying to collectively create, the stakeholders that we need to serve, you know, all of that stuff. It's, it, I want to get good ideas. I want to get things that are not my thinking. And I'm doing a survey because I think some of you may speak up. You touched on it a little bit, but sometimes people aren't going to say things in a room full of people right. that they would do if they had the opportunity to write. And so we, we, we touched on this a little bit, but I'm going to go there. And that is getting feedback from people is an art in of itself. Yes, it is. So sometimes you want to have a brainstorm because this person saying this will sponsor, will spawn trigger. somebody yeah, else, yeah. trigger somebody else. To, trigger is not a good word. But, okay. um, but will help somebody else seed, an idea. seed uh, an idea to say this or this or this. So do that. Mm -hmm. But then also, by the way, uh, if you want to just write something down and throw it in this box, mm -hmm. that's useful to me too. Mm -hmm. Or if you want to just send me an email or a text afterwards, or, 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 or. Give people different opportunities um, to say things. Because, as you know, some people don't want to say things in public. Some people want to make sure that they don't seem foolish or don't want to be against the crowd yeah. or don't want to feel like they're swimming against the crowd or don't feel like... Or they may want to say, look... 
the emperor has no clothes here. You guys are all up there thinking you know what's going on, and you don't. Mm -hmm. And I need to be the one to tell you, right? And so and it's okay that somebody's not going to raise their hand and say something in a public forum, but that they write it down or they do use some other communication to get it to you. Yeah, so the some other communication is maybe where we'll end with this one. Because I, I'm thinking about situations where someone is simply not going to respond to a survey. They're surveyed out. Yeah, me too. I, I will say anything in a room full of people or one-on-one, -on -one, and that's the way to get something out of me. I can't tell you how many surveys by email I've deleted. Even if I want, and I like the organization, I'd like to give them feedback. I'm just not going to open up and take a survey. I get it. And, and, and I, I feel terrible even saying that out loud because a lot of people really want the feedback, et cetera. But, but a, a quick phone call, a quick text, a quick... Uh, uh, or in person the next time you're seeing me, hey, by the way, can I take two minutes and just ask you these things? That's the way to get feedback from me. Well, that's good. And then I think you also have to think through some alternative options, especially if there's a lot of trauma involved. So yes. when you're getting into the nonprofit space and you're working with people that have been victims of a crime, mm -hmm. they've been highly traumatized, sometimes having the you know exercise of going through these questions can, can be really disturbing. And so there are alternatives to getting data, right? So there are art exercises. Mm -hmm. There are other opportunities. Yeah, even not and, writing or speaking. Yeah. And so if you find yourself in a situation where there's a lot of tension, where things are maybe highly volatile, having that step back and a different approach rather than vocal or even writing sometimes could be very, very impactful. Say, hey, you know what? Let's take a moment to draw a picture. What are, what are the top three things that you're feeling right now? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, and if they draw a super angry face with smoke coming out of their head, right? If, if those are the types of responses that you're getting, you need to be aware. And so, again, there's a lot of training around this, and I don't want to pretend to be the subject matter expert because I've taken, you know, three-fifths of a class. But it's really impactful stuff to me, and I just am continuing to be amazed at how much research has gone into the art of asking a question. Yeah, and that whole feelings thing is funny to me because I cannot wait for Inside Out 2 to come out this me summer. Me too. <laughs> as, a, as a good grandpa, and I can't wait to see it. And But I, but I understand feelings now. Mm -hmm. If you'd have asked me this even 15 years ago, I'd have said, oh, come on. Yeah. What am I feeling right now? What does that got to do with anything? Mm -hmm. Right? And so uh, at different stages in people's lives, et cetera. And it, it just goes to show that, you know, there's you've got to get your feedback in various ways yes. and in the way that's most effective to get the data that you're looking for in order to then take action. Mm. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tee up next week because I think it it's very a uh, smooth transition. And it goes into something that you and Mike were talking about two episodes ago about that intersection of curiosity and judgment. Mm -hmm. So when you've taken the time to ask the questions and you've gotten the feedback and in your example of you as a leader have to make decisions about what you can implement and what you cannot, that is the time when curiosity and judgment have to be both enacted because mm -hmm. maybe yes, you're going to act on this part, but you don't have the budget for that, so you, the judgment is, I cannot. That's right. And so I think maybe let's jump into that next time. Absolutely. Okay, cool. This has been a fast and furious look at all things around questions and surveys and feedback. So I hope you've gotten some nuggets out of this that you can take away and apply in your own life. And as always, we love it when you take the time to make some comments on the YouTube channel or on the website. So curiositynotjudgment.com. Or, of course, you can just post that comment right there on the YouTube page. Take care. We'll see you next time.